Good morning, everybody. This is Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council with another episode of Connect Montana. Thanks, everybody, for coming on. It's a big week here this week. Uh, unlike our previous weeks where we had international experts come in and talk a little bit about what they do, this week we're asking native Missoulians to come and talk to us a little bit about the international aspects and the international perspectives of Missoula and of Montana. I've heard some people say that uh, Montana doesn't have much of an international perspective. I think they would be very wrong. Um, certainly um, in terms of the private sector from timber to minerals um, and today with agriculture and ranching and not the least of which is also the emerging tech and optics and service industries as well as our university system has really lent an, an extraordinary uh, international element to our state and our communities. So our first guest this week, I'm very happy to, to have uh, Mayor John Engen from Missoula join us. John is Missoula's 50th and longest serving mayor. He's accountable for the day-to-day -day operations of the city while providing leadership and vision for a community where quality of life is a core value for citizens. Engen's accomplishments range from comprehensive planning efforts to ensure that Missoula is a compact, compact, sustainable city to restoring the city's once private water system to public ownership. He's been a champion of conservation efforts, a partner in battling hunger and homelessness, and a proponent of thoughtful business development. Mayor Engen, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Be with you today. Um, certainly uh, appropriate that we talk about uh, Missoula's international nature because it turns out a global pandemic is a great reminder that uh, that uh, geographic and political borders don't necessarily make a lot of difference when we're faced with a threat or a crisis uh, or opportunities for that matter. So yeah, Missoula, Missoula for all the reasons you mentioned and I think more, um, turns out to be Montana's international city. a lot for that, um, John. Um, I know uh, a lot of the participants in this show may not um, have been born here, frankly, in Montana, um, who, who've come here to Missoula and Montana uh, and have found a life. Um, so some of them might not know um, what was going on here in Missoula and in western Montana, say, 20, 30 years ago in terms of timber and minerals and the connections that Montana had and still has with the rest of the world's rest of the world in those industries, I wonder if you could say a word about you know um, uh, about those, please. Sure. Yeah. I mean, by virtue of house arrest, I've lived in Missoula all of my fifty-five years, and so I've seen a lot of change. Uh, and I grew up really in a timber town. Uh, Missoula was a place where uh, logging, no work, uh, and timber-related industry was was a critical component of the local economy, um, grew up in a place that uh, that uh, burned wood scrap in uh, what were called giant teepee burners. Um, and those were in places, uh, including the heart of the city where Southgate Mall is today. Um, I grew up a couple of blocks away from a, from a uh, lumber mill um, that's now a city park and condominiums. Uh, but for a long time, timber jobs are what mattered in Missoula and those relationships, again, with uh, those economic relationships with Canada, um, in particular with regard to the timber industry, were critical. Um, over the course of the, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, uh, the timber industry changed dramatically, and it was really a, a slow uh, and I think painful decline. Uh, and our economic development strategy for a long time was how do we turn how do we turn back the clock and become a timber town again? And uh, and mid you know early to mid 90s, I think uh, collectively, uh, folks recognized that we probably weren't going to go back in time. That that industry had changed so dramatically, that the infrastructure had changed so dramatically that uh, that something new was on the horizon. And the fact that we have a university here in Missoula is uh, a critical component, I think, of what has been a, a transition uh, over time.
to a service economy. And when we talk about service economy, it's less about uh, it's less about flipping burgers. Though um, I can tell you that I enjoy a flipped burger as much as the next person, uh, and and more about providing those services that allow people to really um, export talent. Uh, so that began with kind of back office stuff. Sorry, the hazard of working from home is some ambient noise. Uh, so that transition began with uh, with a lot of back office work, things that could be done anywhere by virtue of technology. Um, and that's transitioned even further into, into a lot of value added services, uh, headquarters for tech companies. Uh, and interestingly, uh, uh, what we call the experiential economy. Um, you live in a place that's beautiful, that has uh, cool people and an entrepreneurial spirit. And the next thing you know, you've got cultural tourism, um, which goes hand in hand with, with that international feel that I think uh, has slowly emerged in Missoula. John, those changes that you mentioned, you know, they mirror in part and are propelled in part by changes in the world. So, you know, obviously a, a big difference between 30 years ago and today is our ability to connect, to communicate, to learn from, and to engage with people all around the world, oftentimes in real time. So we're, we're living in a different place. Could you say a few words about why that's important to the city of Missoula and what effect that has on Missoula's place in the world? Well, if you if you if you think about the barriers to uh, to living where you want to live, let let's say that your circumstances uh, allow you to make that choice in general, but for a few things, uh, my job, for example, keeps me in a place. I am I am locked to a to a certain place because that's where my work is. Uh, technology has changed all of that. And so your work, as uh, my millennial friends remind me pretty often, um, work is a thing you do, it's not a place you go. And that's a little foreign to a, a middle-aged boomer, but um, it is a fact. And so, uh, so if you look to places where quality of life matters and lots of folks in this world are in a position where they can make those choices about where they want to live, uh, a clean, safe, uh, mid-sized community with uh, all of the amenities of a metro area, uh, but very few of the hassles. And it turns out that Missoula is just that place. So people, A, spy the place, B, realize that there is not, a, the, the old impediments to living where you want to live don't exist anymore. Uh, and suddenly you're, you're doing business from your kitchen table or uh, an espresso bar or you name it. So there's a lot of opportunity um, for people, um, for businesses, um, for others to come to Montana, to come to Missoula um, and benefit from the things that you mentioned. Um, so, uh, but I wonder also about the risks involved. Um, do you see uh, in terms of um, this engagement in the world, are there any risks for the city of Missoula and our community? You know, I, 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 think, I think the biggest risk that we continue to face and struggle with um, is, is a, a, a global economy that continues to create haves and have nots um, that, that in, in some places provides people boundless opportunities and in other places leaves folks behind, and I'm very concerned about us leaving folks behind. I don't want to be a community where, where people parachute in um, uh, be, because just because they can um, and then ask to close the doors behind them or don't wish to contribute fully and engage fully in the community. Um, I, I don't think that happens often, but it is certainly a risk um, that, that, that folks are simply left out of, of the prosperity equation. Uh, and we see evidence of that. And it gets, I mean, clearly exacerbated by, uh, by what we've experienced through the pandemic. We're recognizing that, uh, that vulnerable populations are made more vulnerable in times of crisis. Uh, 
and it's incumbent, I think, upon really any more local government and communities to try to figure out ways to address that uh, where they are, because the help doesn't appear to be coming from elsewhere in many cases. Well, that, that last part there was going to be my next question. I'll ask it anyway, John, just to see if, if you have any perspective on this. But, you know, a, a number of the risks that, that you uh, described and a number that, that we here in Missoula are also concerned about and familiar with, you talk about the haves and the have-nots, a, a good wage, affordable housing. Uh, these are things, obviously, um, not simply in Missoula or in the United States. They're all over the world, of course, you know, as a, uh, you know, as an entire um, international community, uh, we're, we're concerned about those things. Um, does the city of Missoula, um, uh, do they stand to learn anything or, or maybe ha have they learned or, or um, connected with any other communities <clears throat> or other experts outside of the United States? to get some learning, some information about these concerns that we all share? We do, I think we, you know, I think we look everywhere for models. I am not, uh, I am not embarrassed at all about stealing good ideas. I don't find the need to reinvent the wheel if somebody's got something rolling already. Uh, and I mean, interestingly enough, just this morning I had some correspondence with uh, my counterpart in our sister city of Palmerston North, New Zealand, uh, had, had correspondence with the mayor, um, described a situation in New Zealand very similar to ours, and the first place he went in that correspondence was, uh, was really about taking care of people who were vulnerable, understanding how, uh, how we could help people who didn't have the, the means or the resources, um, or in some cases, uh, just by virtue of where they are in life, the sophistication to navigate the various systems that provide help and assistance, and uh, the, the he ended with a he ended with a uh, uh, Maori uh, saying uh, around being strong. I mean, it's really that sort of international notion of resilience that I think we all hold dear and express in a variety of ways. Um, so yeah, we're stealing ideas from places like Palmerston North. Um, we're stealing ideas from uh, other communities uh, around the United States, but uh, yeah, good good ideas certainly aren't exclusive to Missoula. John, you mentioned earlier the university. Uh, so Missoula, like um, other major cities in Montana, uh, has a very vibrant academic um, culture. Um, here, particularly, the University of Montana has a broad range of international programs, uh, and we will have a guest on from the Office of Global Engagement on Thursday, so we'll get more in depth about the university itself. Um, but um, to you, Mayor, how do you see um, the university's place in Missoula vis-a-vis -vis our international perspective? We've, we've long recognized the value of the University of Montana and of Missoula um, as a place and the university as an institution are inextricable. I don't think uh, either would thrive uh, without the other. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is that in the, you know, in the Rocky Mountain West, uh, but for uh, a university that attracts um, scholars, students, uh, faculty, and staff from other places, we might not really have the, the cultural diversity that we have today, or really the interest in it. And those international programs uh, ebb and flow. Um, but I think uh, the degree to which we celebrate those international relationships, um, the more that we understand the world, not only through academic programming, but by uh, but through people-to-people -people relationships that we establish with students, faculty, and staff, um, the better off we are. And we we worked pretty hard at the city of Missoula uh, to recognize that we we fund uh, Arts Missoula, um, which uh, which uh, provided us an opportunity to uh, hire someone full time. I happen to see him in his what appears to be pilot regalia today. Um, has joined us, Udo Fluke, uh, 
and you know Udo Udo's job is to is to really elevate and facilitate uh, and grow those international programs and those relationships because we recognize the value. Uh, our hope is that we continue to attract international students, uh, more international students, and there's also this link with our uh, our refugee population. Missoula is a welcoming city. Um, and that didn't just begin with human rights crises in the Congo, Congo or Eritrea or Syria or Iraq. They began uh, in the late 70s and early 80s with, uh, with the Hmong people from Laos. Um, Missoula was a home for resettlement at that time. And we cite the Hmong people as a, as a prime example of folks who have been able to maintain their cultural identity um, while also blending in and and uh, and uh, adding uh, American or Missoula Missoula culture uh, to their uh, human portfolio, as it were. Um, so we have we have this interesting mix, and I think that mix continues to to expand. John, I have a question here from one of our participants. It's pushing the boundaries of an international question, but maybe you can spin it in such a way. Question, is there any way to tie in minimum wage to the cost of median home or rental prices, i.e. wages must permit someone to pay no more than a certain percentage of their income for housing? Uh, so the, the, short, the short answer is that barring some statutory changes, um, at the state level, no. Um, however, at the city of Missoula, for example, we've moved to a $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, that still doesn't meet the, uh, that generally still doesn't meet the, match the cost of housing as a percentage of income. Uh, so we're working at that from the other side. And that other side is how do we, as a city, work to subsidize uh, housing? And that comes in the form of uh, anything from actually owning uh, and having uh, limited equity models uh, to providing land. And that's one of the things that's been most effective for us. And then supporting nonprofit developers who guarantee long-term affordability as a function of uh, city participation. Um, our housing policy is, uh, goes into uh, great detail uh, with regard to um, our strategies around housing affordability. And then on the wage side, we've worked very hard through the Missoula Economic Partnership, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary, really born of, a, born of the last Great Recession, um, and has, uh, has been a facilitator for the thousands of living wage jobs that have come to Missoula over the course of the last decade. Um, we're nowhere near perfect, um, and it's it's a piece of the puzzle that I'm working on with staff and council every day. Here's another one from a participant. We tend to be consumed by the challenges and setbacks from the current coronavirus. What do you see as some opportunities that could come out of this global pandemic for the city of Missoula? Well, we talk about, you know, we've talked about resiliency and we've talked about resiliency really in the context of climate change. And there's been a lot of work done uh, in the city of Missoula, uh, Missoula County and working with the University of Montana uh, to create plans and protocols for limiting our carbon footprint uh, to move toward 100% clean energy uh, and much more. And I think the, the Coronavirus has uh, taught us a little bit more about resiliency um, and, and really brought home the idea that if you don't have a home, you are at risk. And, uh, and those, again, the exacerbation is the word of the day. Um, those risks of homelessness are just exacerbated in crisis. So if we house more people, if more people have a safe, decent roof over their heads, um, they are going to be far less vulnerable and the community will be far less vulnerable as well. I think there's a clear lesson that we learned from that. I also think there's a lesson in cooperation and collaboration. Uh, you know, before this crisis, uh, uh, it, it would have been unheard of for University of Montana School District, Missoula County, City of Missoula, Health Department, 
uh, emergency operations and other leaders to be on daily phone calls to talk about challenges and opportunities. Uh, that began, you know, a month and a half or better ago now as time flies. Uh, and I believe we have a great opportunity to continue those calls and continue to solve problems in that really collaborative way. It turns out we work really well together, um, that when we have all those voices at the table, uh, we have more opportunity to really solve problems and solve problems quickly. One of the things I've learned is that uh, uh, we, we've done more just in sort of general process improvement at the city of Missoula in the last two months than we would have likely gotten done in five years uh, because of that sense of urgency and because of our ability to uh, sort of put um, some of the, the barriers which um, are pretty easy to spot uh, and hard to overcome aside uh, and just put our heads down and, and heads together and solve problems. And I think those are tremendous opportunities. Yeah, I'd like to think that we're all maybe learning that lesson about uh, reconnecting and recommunicating and, and uh, the power of that very simple act. Yeah. Another question from uh, Brigitte Miranda Freer. She's the executive director at the Montana World Trade Center. What is the current state of Missoula's program to welcome refugees? I, I think as, as many of us know, there was some um, uh, question on the federal policy and the number of refugees who would be able to come in and what that might mean for cities like Missoula. Could you give us an update, Mayor? Sure, we continue to be, uh, we continue to be really at the mercy in, in terms of our resettlement program. Uh, we're at the mercy of the federal government um, and those directives shift and change and um, frankly, they're challenging for me to keep track of. Um, I have regular correspondence with Jen Barilli, who is the local director of the International Re uh, Rescue Committee, our local uh, resettlement agency, along with our local nonprofit, uh, Soft Landing, um, that really spurred the, the refugee resettlement uh, movement here in Missoula, uh, or reignited it. Uh, and uh, we continue, uh, the, the numbers will be limited, the numbers of refugees who are allowed to, to uh, migrate to uh, the United States will continue to be limited. Um, and those numbers continue based on what I've seen to be in flux. Uh, but our hope is that the success of our program uh, continues to demonstrate uh, to the cooler heads that may prevail uh, that the United States is still a place where our tired and poor uh, can come and build lives and grow communities and make us all stronger and better. John, we've got time for one more participant question. Um, Donna Anderson, who is the head of the Global Engagement Office at the University of Montana, writes, what conversations and collaborations are currently happening with our international sister cities? Anything new in light of the global pandemic? You know, uh, apart from the correspondence, and I, I need to uh, I need to check back in. I've got a little time difference that causes a problem with New Zealand, but uh, I'm going to check in with uh, with uh, Grant Smith, the mayor of Palmerston North, uh, today. Uh, frankly, have not heard anything from our uh, sister city in Nakargamun, uh, but intend to reach out. Uh, to the Burgermeister, as it were, uh, and see what's happening there. I have some friends in uh, Munich and in London, and so I'm hearing a little bit about what's afoot in those places. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll try to trade some ideas that our, our systems of government are quite different. Um, but again, uh, those systems can change, and in some cases they can change at the local level. Thanks for that, John. Um, I just want to add that, um, you know, I have been um, extremely pleased as a newcomer to the Missoula community to see all of the opportunities and the different international aspects and perspectives, the city, the community, the university, the private sector, um, and, uh, you know, across the board have to offer. Uh, it's been quite invigorating for somebody who's really interested in these things like myself and our organization. So thank you very much for sharing your perspectives, Mr. Mayor. Over to you for any last words. Uh, just thank you for the opportunity and thanks to uh, the World Affairs Council. Um, 
the World Trade Center uh, Cultural Affairs at Arts Missoula. I mean, we have champions in this arena. You're one, Brigida is certainly one, Udo is one, uh, and there are many others who have been, uh, who have been uh, leading the way and ensuring that, uh, that international programming and international relationships uh, are on the minds of Missoulians and that our lives are, or our perspectives are broadened. Um, and so the, the programming that you all provide, um, whether it's, uh, there was a time when it was all in person, but now Zoom works as well. Uh, the more of that programming that's out there, the more aware we become and the, the smaller the world gets in all of the right ways. So thank you again. I appreciate your time this morning and all of what you all do. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for joining us and those words of encouragement. Um, to be sure, the ground is very fertile here in Montana and in Missoula for um, the kind of engagement that the Montana World Affairs Council, the World Trade Center, and others do. So um, it makes our job uh, much easier. So that is concluding our show this morning with Mayor John Engen. Tomorrow, we've got Dr. Udo Flunk, of course. He's the Director of Global and Cultural Affairs for the City of Missoula. Uh, that's again at 9.30 a.m. So we're going to hear a little bit of uh, Udo's um, perspectives on, again, Missoula, its international aspects, its international perspectives, and what that means for the city and our community. That's followed on Wednesday, Wednesday excuse me, with Fernando um, Barreto, uh, sorry, Mena Barreto Krum, sorry if I've axed that name. She is the co-founder of Imagination Brewing from Brazil. She's a longtime Missoulian who's going to share her perspectives. And then the Associate Director of Global Engagement at the University of Montana, Maria Unkuri Chowdhury, uh, will join us. All of those shows are at 930. I very much hope that you can join us. Thank you all for coming. Have a good day.